Hello, everyone. This is Renee Tanner, and I'm at Arizona State University Libraries, and I'm also the convener for the Digital Curation Interest Group. Welcome, everyone, to our Midwinter bus Business Meeting and Program. Uh, today's webinar has two parts. The first part is going to be Cam Woods talking about the Big Curator Project, and the second part will be a brief business meeting. And after both, you'll have an opportunity to ask questions, so I hope that you um, Hope that you have questions for us, that'd be great. So to start, I'd like to do an introduction for Cam. Cam Woods is a research scientist in the School of Information and Library Science at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. He is also the technical lead on the Bit Curator project and began working with open source digital forensics tools in 2011, which led to the foundation of the Bit Curator project. Welcome, Cam. Thanks for, for joining us today. Thanks, Renee. I'll go ahead and let you start your presentation. Great. Um, well, thank you for, uh, for being here, everyone. Uh, as, as Renee said, I'm, I'm Cam Woods. I'm a research scientist at, at UNC Chapel Hill. Um, I've been working here about seven years now. Uh, I, I originally came here to work as a postdoc under, under Cal Lee, and he and I eventually developed some uh, grant proposals uh, around or late 2010 to, uh, w with the idea of developing tools and environments that would bring digital forensics techniques to libraries, archives, museums, basically allowing them to apply these kind of powerful uh, data extraction and analytics techni techniques to, uh, to materials, so particularly legacy materials they might have in their collection. So that's a little bit of the motivation for this. Um, mo a lot of our work has been uh, has been focused on the development of this environment that makes these tools accessible, and so I'll be talking about that today. Uh, this, this talk is kind of a, a sort of 30,000 foot view of many of the uh, uh, tools and processes that are integrated into this environment. So uh, you may run into, uh, sort of if, you, if you see technical terms or, um, uh, or tools you're not familiar with in here, most of this stuff is documented uh, quite, uh, quite carefully on our wiki, and there'll be links. To, uh, to that later on in the presentation. All right, so, so let's get started. Um, so, you know, the motivation for this work was, you know, came from sort of our, our years of working with collecting institutions and seeing this increasing problem of uh, the challenges they face when they're working with these born digital materials, particularly legacy materials. So uh, the simplest of these were just kind of physical decay, uh, obsolescence. But then the trickier ones are kind of format obsolescence, uh, the, the problems of identifying file formats and file system formats on media that you might not know the source of, uh, being able to render old uh, formats and modern tools, being able to assess materials for, uh, to identify private and sensitive information. And a lot of these, uh, a lot of these techniques uh, sort of uh, steered us towards digital forensics tools that could help with this. Um, so, uh, you know, as a as a start, uh, when we first uh, put this, sorry, <laughs> when we first put this grant proposal into the Mellon Foundation, the uh, the idea was we'd, we'd package up open source tools and develop some new tools to uh, address areas where those tools uh, did not have appropriate functionality for libraries, archives, and museums. So we wanted to develop this environment that could be used. Uh, in many different collecting institutions that would incorporate both digital forensics tools that would allow them uh, allow these collecting institutions simply to extract the data from these physical media in a in a safe uh, in a safe way, uh, allow them to analyze file systems and export content and metadata and provide access to those materials, which which wasn't a concern for uh, for many of these institutions to begin or uh, for uh, for law enforcement institutions working with, uh, say, traditional open source and, and forensics tools, uh, tr traditional open source forensics and uh, commercial forensics tools. Uh, so this is a screenshot over here on the right of, of the BitCreator environment as it exists today. If you've used Ubuntu before, uh, this will look very familiar. And uh, over the course of this talk, I'll be sort of introducing you to some of these tools and some of the modifications we've made to this environment. Uh, to, uh, to assist in uh, uh, sort of steering it towards the needs of collecting institutions. So, so why did we do this? So 
a lot of the existing digital forensics tools we, we, we ran into had a lot of really great functionality. They, had, they were very powerful tools for uh, assessing the integrity of original physical media, uh, for identifying points of failure when you attempted to extract bit streams or identify file systems on that media. Um, and, and certainly in, the, in, the, uh, in terms of identifying potentially private and sensitive information, which I'll be talking about soon. Um, but they don't always fit well within the primary workflows of collecting institutions. So, uh, so the commercial forensics tools that were out there were very heavily geared towards uh, law enforcement and sort of courtroom activities where everything was packaged in a case and it was prepared in a format that wasn't ever intended for public release. And uh, was typically prepared or was typically geared towards expert technicians who you know would be would be performing this job in a very kind of narrow capacity uh, in in many cases. Uh, open source tools uh, at at the time that we started this project uh, had had a similar focus and and some of them um, have uh, have evolved since then, but you know they, they often aren't concerned with these same things that libraries, archives, and museums are concerned with, which is which are structure and persistence of metadata. Uh, provisions for public access, deciding when to provide access and when not to provide access, uh, and then support for older technologies. So most modern uh, forensics tools and libraries don't really provide support for uh, uh, very old media, floppy disks or uh, older Mac file systems, for example, because those aren't uh, those aren't areas of concern for sort of modern criminal cases. But they're but they're materials that are likely to turn up in collecting institutions working with legacy media. Um, oh, and I should mention, if, if anybody would like to uh, uh, interrupt me, please feel free to uh, enter a question in the chat. So the goals of this project were sort of uh, multi multifold. So we wanted to provide the uh, collecting professionals with a system that uh, would allow them to do uh, perform all these use useful tasks in kind of one integrated environment. So this would include me media imaging, that is extracting bit streams from different types of media, including older media, floppies, uh, tapes, and so on. Uh, uh, performing file system analysis, so uh, examining, uh, automatically identifying which kinds of file systems were on these media, particularly if they hadn't been touched in many years, uh, and then and then identifying potentially private and sensitive information. So this was uh, uh, when we when we originally spoke to interested parties working with this project. You know, this is a big area of focus for them, uh, particularly uh, in terms of you know when they spoke with donors who were providing materials or they were deciding on uh, which which materials needed to be closed or restricted and so on. Um, and so this project kind of addresses two fundamental needs that are that are not. Uh, typically incorporated into the tools produced by the digital forensics industry, and that's uh, you know we we think this environment fits uh, uh, fits more smoothly into the workflow of archives and libraries, uh, particularly for uh, uh, ingest and collection management, uh, and and particularly for interacting or interoperating with uh, existing collecting management software, and then finally for providing public access to the data. Um, so this is a, I, I realize, I, I, I usually hate it when people say this, but I realize you, you probably can't uh, read most of the contents of this slide, but there is a link here that will take you to, uh, to, a, to a section on our wiki that has this kind of blown up and shows each of the sets of tools. Uh, but the kind of big idea here is the, the functionality that we've built into this environment focus, focuses kind of on four specific areas. Up here, up at the top, this is acquisition. And, and, and we're using this term purely as a, as a technical term here, right? Acquisition of bit streams from physical media. Um, reporting is the bulk of, of the, uh, is, uh, the bulk of the tools that are incorporated into the, into the environment. And this includes uh, reporting on uh, technical metadata that's incorporated into the file system, reporting on uh, potentially sensitive information and other features of interest. Uh, reporting on system uh, system data, things like uh, if you have if you have media that incorporated an original operating or that was uh, that uh, that held an original operating system, uh, extracting information about how that uh, how that uh, how that system was used, who who was using it, who logged into it, and so on. Um, 
Uh, we have a section on redaction. Uh, this is actually a separate tool in our, uh, in our repository, but I'll provide the link to that later. Uh, so for, uh, for users who may want to uh, do, uh, take some sort of action uh, on the uh, metadata that's extracted from or, or uh, features of interest that are extracted from the tools, they have a redaction tool that can support that. And finally, metadata export. And this includes uh, both raw technical metadata and uh, metadata that looks a little bit more familiar to uh, uh, collecting institutions such as uh, premise preservation metadata. A little bit about the development history, and I'll, and I'll get more into the tool in a minute, but uh, we, uh, we don't generally uh, do any of our work in a vacuum. So most of our work is, uh, is geared towards kind of producing functional tools that meet the needs of a specific set of, uh, of professionals and people who've expressed interest in the work. So uh, this, this sort of steps back all the way to when we put these funding proposals in. So when we first put the uh, proposal in for the Mellon Foundation, uh, the, the tool, development of the tool was funded for two years from, uh, from October 2011 to 2013. Uh, and then based on the kind of initial success of that, uh, Mellon funded us for another year. Uh, we originally partnered with the Maryland Institute for Technology and the Humanities, which um, some of you are probably familiar with, Matt Kirschenbaum there, who has uh, a lot of kind of shared interests with these tools. So that was a, that was a powerful uh, partnership for us because it allowed us to get uh, uh, to sort of expose these tools and techniques and some of the ideas we had about this to uh, not just the traditional collecting inst uh, institutions but also kind of the digital humanities community and, and other people that, that uh, MIT is tied into. Um, so you can see development doc uh, and project documentation posted on the Bit Curator Wiki that includes some of uh, some additional comment uh, some additional commentary on the development history. Uh, the original core team that was developed here, and I, I put this in uh, to make it clear that uh, you know that there are a lot of people involved. Or there have been a lot of people involved in this effort. Uh, Cal Lee, who's a, a professor here at UNC Sills, was the PI. Matt, Matt Kirschenbaum, as I just mentioned, was the co-PI. I was the tech lead. Porter Olson was the community lead. Porter Olson was working at MIP at the time. Uh, Alex Chesnoff, who was a, uh, a doctoral student, was our project manager here. She's now at MIT. Uh, Sunita Mizra uh, is our ongoing software developer here, and then Kyle Bickoff was uh, also at MIT, uh, was, our, was our GA there. And there are many other people involved as well. Um, so when we put this, I maybe have lost, oh no, there we go. So when we put this together, you know, the goal was to, again, was to, was to focus these development efforts on uh, on tasks that would be of most use to the community. So we put together two different uh, panels, one of which was a professional experts panel. This panel kind of uh, advised, the, uh, advised the sort of high level goals for uh, what tasks should be addressed in the environment. And then a development advisory group which focused more on the sort of technical nuts and bolts of, uh, of what tools would be used uh, to, uh, to generate this environment. And I just included this again to, to make it clear that uh, you know, this was, this was a, a tool that was developed with a lot of input from the community. We've had many other partners and affiliates. Um, uh, the, the environment's being used in libraries, archives, museums around the world. Um, again, we've had found funding from the Mellon Foundation. We've partnered with other collection management systems and uh, companies that produce uh, tools, notably uh, Archimatica, the Open Preservation Foundation, uh, and, and sorry, that should be Artifactual, of course, that produce Archimatica, uh, and uh, an archive space to kind of uh, address some of these needs, particularly with respect to access. Uh, so, so sort of back to the tool itself. So uh, the, as I said before, this is a, this is a uh, Ubuntu environment. Uh, it's a, we, we package it in a way that it can be deployed in, uh, in, a, in a range of different ways. So um, you can run it as a live environment from a USB stick. If, if anybody on the, the call has had experience with other live recovery or forensic environments, this is kind of the traditional way these environments are deployed. You write them to a USB stick, you plug that into a machine, 
you turn on the machine and boot from that stick and use that as the recovery uh, as the recovery uh, operating system for uh, working with damaged or uh, or hardware that you're um, you know unsure what's on or what's on the original device or you can't get access to the hard disk or um, you know any any number of other uh, any number of other reasons. Um, that same uh, that same ISO can be used to install BitCreator as the host operating system on a uh, on a dedicated machine, and then we also provide a uh, completely pre-configured virtual machine. So if you have uh, if you have VirtualBox, we uh, distribute this as a VirtualBox virtual machine. VirtualBox is free virtualization software. It'll run on a laptop. Uh, most modern laptops run just fine, and we have that uh, we have that VM configured so that you can just download it, unpack it, and it'll start running right away in a virtual machine. <clears throat> and we've provided uh, quick start instructions on our website that will kind of uh, uh, that will run you through uh, in in great detail all the steps required to set up a machine if you've never used any of these technologies before. So when you boot up this environment, there are there's some things that make this environment uh, unique that 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 are that are uh, customized. In, in a way that we think suits the needs of, of collecting institutions working, particularly those working with legacy institutions who may not have a lot of other dedicated hardware uh, av available for that, who, for example, may not have dedicated forensic workstations or dedicated write blocking hardware that would prevent you from writing back to a disk when you plugged it into a machine. Uh, so when you first boot up uh, BitCreator, uh, one of the things you'll notice that's a little bit different from the standard Ubuntu environment is this is green disk in the top. Uh, this is a little front end for a tool that we've adapted from other forensic environments that enforces read-only mounting of any attached device and actually prevents any attached device from being auto-mounted. So when you plug uh, devices, whether it's a USB floppy disk or a uh, or a hard disk through an adapter or a, a, you know, an SD card, whatever, uh, as long as the uh, device can be sort of physically recognized, it won't automatically mount on the desktop. Um, and then when you do choose to mount it, it will automatically mount uh, read only. Uh, now, software, this kind of, this is sometimes called software write blocking. That's kind of a misnomer. There's, no, there's really no such thing as true software write blocking. But uh, this, is, this is something that can help prevent common failure modes. So, one common one is uh, if you plug devices into modern Macintosh operating systems, they will, uh, the spotlight utility will start writing out indexing data to the original drive, and at that point you've altered the composition of, you know, an artifact. So uh, to avoid this, BitCreator has this, uh, has this facility built in. You can turn this facility off and it'll, it'll uh, the color of the icon will change up here. Uh, BigCreator includes a, a wide range of utilities to allow you to make exact copies of data from media. So uh, when we refer to disk images, that's uh, a disk image is just a sector-by-sector uh, uh, -sector copy of the original media, not just the file system or not just the allocated part of the disk, but literally every sector on the disk. Um, and uh, so you'll notice over here in this screenshot, there's a, there's a lot of sort of uh, traditional Unix tools for doing this kind of thing. Um, DD, some uh, some forensically repackaged versions of DD that were developed for law enforcement and government, and then uh, uh, another tool I'll talk about in just a minute on the next slide. Um, the reason that, uh, that that it's useful to do this is that when you have a complete disk image, it gives you a lot of flexibility in working with uh, in working with uh, a, basically a, um, a an equivalent uh, accessible version of the original physical media without having to uh, without having to uh, risk additional wear and tear on that media, for, uh, particularly if you're say working with a floppy disk or a very old hard disk, uh, and you're not sure uh, <clears throat> how uh, how viable that media still is. Uh, pulling uh, data off of a disk like this also lets you get uh, uh, get access to other kinds of attributes and. For example, uh, or and potentially deleted files that aren't visible through high-level copy operations. So when you mount disks, uh, you see basically only those files that are allocated on disk. But creating a disk image and running it through some of these forensics tools can uh, can allow you to uh, 
uh, gain access to uh, data that's still extant on the disk but wouldn't uh, typically be displayed in a, on a mounted uh, system. And this can be, val obviously you can imagine why this is valuable for law enforcement, but it can be, it can be valuable for collecting institutions too, particularly when uh, there's some concern over uh, whether data has been uh, accidentally lost in transfer from a donor and so on. Uh, or if the media is only partially viable uh, and some sort of more heroic recovery efforts need to be applied to extract data from that media. Um, so disk images ensure that we retain all the original metadata and provide this kind of record of the original order of the files as they were created, uh, which, is, uh, which, is another, uh, which is another significant concern. Um, there's a, uh, there's a uh, really great high-level tool built into, uh, built into BigCritter called Gamager. Uh, Gamager is this fast, multi-threaded tool that lets you create raw and forensically packaged images. So raw images would just be just the byte stream for this forensically packaged image would be uh, that byte stream uh, packaged in a way that includes additional metadata that includes um, some cyclic redundancy check uh, checksums so that uh, if you have any data loss in the future, uh, parts of the disk image may still be recoverable. This is a very easy to use tool. Um, we've included it because uh, uh, just to basically give people options for, um, for having GUI based tools uh, and not just having to use command line tools. So, uh, and, I, and I've, I'm not really going to go uh, into too much detail about how forensically packaged disk images are, uh, are fundamentally different here. You can find all that information on our wiki. Uh, what I will add is that uh, these, these specialized forensic formats are uh, the ones we use in BigCreator are open, are open source. The, the code for them is available online. The structure is available online. Um, when they're packaged in these formats, they can't be mounted in sort of uh, by traditional operating systems that don't have any knowledge of that format. So one of the additional changes we've made to BitCreator or to the BitCreator environment is we've kind of baked in this custom uh, scripting utility, uh, scripting front end for some of the forensic tool packages that are used to kind of crack open these disk images and allow you to create um, synthetic mounts of these uh, of these uh, disk images on the desktop. And those are just right uh, built into the environment, you right click on a disk image, you get scripts, say mount disk image, and it'll mount uh, nearly any disk image that, uh, that the tool can create. And that can be useful uh, if you just want to, you know, if you're not interested in actually performing uh, additional sort of low level analysis on these images, you can see in this case, we've mounted a disk image uh, that is, uh, that's just full of a bunch of uh, directories. I think this one was full of PDFs. Um, uh, one notable thing about this is that when you have a, an image that's packaged like this, uh, because of the way it's packaged and because of the, uh, the, the redundant checksums in it, you can't make any alterations to this image without, uh, without it being obvious. So this is, uh, this, is one, uh, this is one useful way to ensure uh, that you have, uh, you have an original copy of the image that it has not been altered in any way uh, and it can't accidentally be altered uh, if you have uh, if you have, uh, say, non-technical folks working with it, or even if you have technical folks working with it. Um, BigCreator also has a, a wide variety of forensics tools. So these include things like uh, tools that allow you to generate file system reports, uh, identify private and sensitive information, deduplicate data, uh, examine files for similarity. So we have tools that will examine large sets of files and tell you whether two, two files are likely to contain um, a significant percentage of the same content, even if they're not identical. Um, generate, uh, extract common types of metadata, uh, such as EXIF, and then uh, tools to carve data associated uh, with lost or deleted content, to sort of carve uh, data that doesn't, would not explicitly appear in uh, a mounted disk image out of the underlying bitstream. Uh, we, when we put this project together, we wrote some uh, uh, BigCreator specific reporting exporting tools. Uh, one of these is the BigCreator Disk Image Access tool. So this is a this is a tool that's in that direct or in that folder I just showed you that you can start up, um, load up a disk image, and it'll show you the entire file system actually without mounting that disk image. So again, it uses these forensic libraries to kind of crack open the disk image, automatically identify the file system format. And then present you with a list of uh, a list of files and, and directories 
that includes not just those, uh, again, not just those that would appear if you were to mount the disk, uh, the original disk, but also potentially uh, uh, lost and deleted items. So those are those are marked in red here. Uh, and this tool will make a best effort to try and recover data from those as well. So there's an export facility in this as well. There are uh, there are Windows uh, open source Windows and other forensic utilities that do this. Uh, this was just this is kind of a convenience for um, for users who uh, who might want to quickly look through, uh, particularly quickly look through uh, smaller sets of legacy media. Um, Big Creator also includes uh, several very powerful tools uh, to identify features of interest uh, on the on the disk. The uh, most notable of these is probably Bulk Extractor, which is a tool developed by Simpson Garfinkel at the Naval Postgraduate School. Uh, and Simpson developed this uh, this tool kind of in response to a need he had, which was to uh, analyze very very large collections very quickly for specific types of content. And uh, so he wrote this tool with uh, a series of scanners that are based on uh, that look for certain patterns and execute uh, execute some code based on that pattern uh, when when they run into it. And this is uh, this tool has been optimized so that it kind of scales up and down. So it'll run just fine on your laptop if you if you throw this tool up on a server somewhere where it has access to uh, uh, many many cores and very fast disk. It'll uh, it'll sort of self-identify the environment that's, that it's in, and it'll use as much of uh, as much compute power as it's, as, of, as is available to it to to scan disk images. Uh, there's a command line version of this tool. There's also a front end, um, and many of these scanners. These, there are a lot of different scanners here. I'm not going to go into them all, but uh, some of these features of interest are things like social security numbers, credit card numbers, email addresses, GPS coordinates. Encryption keys and lots of others. So you, uh, you know, when we uh, when we first began talking to collecting institutions about this, we, you know, we these were these were common uh, these were common areas of concern for them, particularly uh, particularly things like social security numbers and driver's license numbers that um, that for certain collections they had a, a mandate to uh, identify and protect. Uh, there's a link here uh, that you can you can go to to read uh, to read a lot more about uh, the structure of this tool. And, you know, and we and we think that uh, particularly this, uh, particularly for say working with donors when assessing submitted materials or just generating re uh, reports about closed or restricted materials or preparing materials for access. This is um, this is kind of a one-stop shop for uh, for certain of the common uh, uh, certain of the common cases that you might be concerned with. The tool has a front end that lets you, uh, that lets you, for example, look at uh, specific categories of these features. So in this case, um, you can see that uh, there are uh, there are references to features at uh, off specific offsets within the disk. In this case, we're looking at email addresses. There's a histogram of the email addresses here that appears uh, that shows how many times a particular email address appears on the disk. Uh, reference to the offset, and then there's a there's a text view over here of where that uh, where that content appeared. Um, now, one of the notable things is that Bulk Extractor actually completely ignores the file system for the most part, and it doesn't uh, it doesn't provide you it just it's just giving you uh, byte offsets, so it's not actually telling you where those files are uh, within the file system in terms of like a directory structure. Um, we do have some other tools built into the environment that allow you to do that, uh, including a t another tool that Simpson wrote to uh, to extract that metadata or to compare and uh, compare and, and generate that metadata. And we've included a high-level reporting tool that we wrote for the original project that uh, that runs basically all of these in sequence. So it'll run Bulk Extractor, FileWalk, a range of other tools. Um, you, you sort of pointed at the original output for Bulk Extractor, pointed at an image file. Given an output directory for these reports, and it'll run all of these automatically. Uh, so, when you uh, when you run this tool, and this can this can take a little while, but when you when you run this tool, you get uh, a series of reports that give you uh, details on file system statistics. So uh, here I've just shown you a, a couple. There's a there's a file system. Uh, there's a there's a this is a report on the formats identified within the file system. A histogram of those reports. This tool will also uh, provide uh, Excel output for all of that bulk extractor output and Excel output for the bulk extractor output matched to the file system contents. 
So even if you, you know, even if you don't have any other expertise dealing with uh, XML metadata or dealing with uh, other kinds of machine readable formats, this tool provides a, a very simple uh, way to uh, to get access to that uh, that data in a structured format that uh, that you can manipulate in other tools. Uh, so these reports, uh, just a, a, a quick review of some, what the other reports look like. Um, there are some PDFs that include uh, an overview of the feature locations on disk that were identified by Bulk Extractor, uh, an overview of the deleted files, any deleted files that were found on a given partition, um, the digital forensics XML output. This would be the file system metadata. So this will include things like modified access and change times for every file on disk, cryptographic checksums, uh, links to show you exactly where the allocated blocks on disk are for the individual files. Um, now, again, this may sound very low level, but uh, you know, for certain types of recovery, uh, uh, recovery uh, scenarios, this may be useful. The format table that you just saw, and uh, and then a very uh, a small section of premise preservation metadata that uh, we essentially generate to allow. Uh, additional or other external systems to uh, keep a record of what ta or what tasks were performed in the BitCreator environment. Um, again, there's, there's a lot of additional functionality in the environment, uh, and, and I'm not going to go through uh, each and every one of these uh, in this in this talk, but uh, we've included, uh, in addition to the tools that we wrote as part of this grant, uh, we included uh, we included a, a, a significant set of other uh, utilities. Here, let me let me see what this question is. So let's say I discover so, uh, this is to everyone. So let's say I discover a set of emails on a laptop, and I want to compare them to a set of 40,000 emails from another source to see if there are duplicates of the larger set. How long would such an exercise take to be completely sure about duplicates versus unique items? Um, so I'm not sure I have a specific answer to that, given that it depends on whether you have uh, what you're comparing in this case, whether you're comparing uh, whether you're comparing just the text of the emails, if you're comparing the text plus the headers plus the uh, extracted, or sorry, plus the uh, plus any um, attachments and so on. Um, I will note that the the tool that I, I just showed you was was a comparison of just for email addresses. Um, that was not a tool to to do direct dedupe on on sort of extracted emails, right? From uh, from a from an original tool, sorry, from an original email client. Um, in terms of the speed that at which at which a, a, a tool like Bulk Extractor runs, I mean the that tool. Um, so we we've run it we've run it over some uh, we've run it over some exported email sets that included about two to three hundred thousand emails and. Just to do the feature identification on uh, on a on a modern MacBook uh, generally takes twenty to thirty seconds. Um, again, I, I can point you to a, I can point you to a, a, a white paper that we've written up that has uh, that has uh, that has some additional detail on that. Uh, but that's uh, that's as much of an answer I think as I have for that right now. Um, <clears throat> So we have a tool in here that uh, that will identify duplicate files. That's that's FSLint. These are again most of these tools are not tools that we wrote. They're just tools that are included in the environment to sort, support additional use cases. Um, FIDO for uh, file characterization, CLAM to scan viruses, um, various types of, of media identification and extraction. Um, the file similarity identification tools, SD hash and SSD, are, are research tools. These, these are command line tools, uh, command line only tools I mentioned uh, earlier that can uh, assist in identifying uh, subsets of, of files within directories that may that may have uh, similar content. Um, we have included uh, the sorry, and this this slide should have been updated. We now have the Bagot Python library. 
and the bagger tool from the Library of Congress that allows you to transfer data in and out of the environment, um, and then some, uh, some additional uh, media tools here. So this uh, this tool uh, this tool set is was as I said before this tool set was originally uh, was originally developed under uh, a couple of Mellon grants that ended in 2014 as part of the terms of that original set of Mellon grants uh, we put into place uh, a basically a, uh, a set of guidelines for how the tool would be or how the how the tool and how the community would be managed uh, after the grant. Uh, after the grant period ended, um, and this uh, this resulted in the in the uh, in the coming together of the Bid Creator Consortium, which is today is the home for the hosting and stewardship of these tools and and uh, managing the user community. Uh, the Educopia Institute, uh, which some of you may be familiar with, is the uh, is the administrative home. A membership dues fund ongoing activities, including uh, including user support and uh, ongoing development. And these are institutional members, not individual members. Um, so all of our software and the documentation for the tool will kind of always continue to be free and open source, but membership provides these additional benefits, right? So we have support, there are, there are membership exclusive training uh, opportunities for the environment, and then development priority for features uh, is, is given to members. Uh, there's a there's a link here again that you can you can follow if you're interested in in uh, sort of knowing a little bit more about who's involved. Uh, it's a it's a mix of different organizations, mostly universities, mostly university archives and libraries, um, uh, some other organizations as well, public and private. And you can find uh, the basically all of the information that I've, I've talked about here is, is on our is on our wiki. Uh, that front page for our wiki includes links to some other projects. So so uh, after we uh, after we completed the original work on the BitCurator project, we've uh, we've performed some additional work uh, that uh, that's related that uses some of the same tools. The second project that we that we uh, undertook after the original BitCurator project was BitCurator Access, which uh, which in which we developed uh, did some additional development on the redaction tools and uh, a web platform for providing access to uh, to disk image content. So you can see that there, uh, and then our current project, which is BitCreator NLP. Um, but we uh, but if you click on that first BitCreator link up at the top on the wiki, you'll, you'll be able to find all the original documentation for this for this site. Um, for anybody with a technical background or interested in seeing uh, how uh, the project is organized and, and what, where the various tools are, you can find uh, links to the, I think there are four associated repositories on, on our GitHub site. Uh, you can find those there. Um, and I think that's it. Do we, do we have any other questions? Yeah, hi everyone. This is Renee. Yeah, let's open it up to questions. Um, I have one I'd like to start with. I'm wondering uh, if you can give an example about how this tool has been used by a university archive, um, how it's been used maybe with a particular collection, and, and how it helped. Yes, so uh, there we have some, we actually have a document online that. I'm sorry. I, I need to go. I need to go pull up the document because I. Um, oh, that's okay. Sure, sure. Yeah. Yeah. So we have a report. We have. We actually have two separate white papers online that uh, that included some of the specific uh, specific stories that were. Um, that, that we that we got from from users that uh, that have used the been using the environment over the years. Um, I don't have them on off the top of my head, unfortunately. Um, oh, that's okay. Yeah, we can. We'll have this recorded, and and I can include a, a link to in the in the message that goes out. Um, yeah, I, as a person, I'm not a very technical person, so I'm I'm thinking about this tool. You know more in lines of how how could somebody who doesn't have a really technical background how could I uh, help my institution like 
what kind of pitch would I give to my institution about to why they should be using BitCurator? So I, I think one of the, you know, we, we actually hear this a lot from different institutions, and I think uh, Cal usually has a, a more detailed answer uh, for this than I do. But uh, one of the uh, one of the sort of common answers that we give is, you know, if you if you want to if you want to be sort of get a sort of sort of start seriously working with particularly working with legacy uh, media collections, you kind of have two or three different options. One of which is to uh, to you know uh, to prioritize the really high value stuff and send it out to a data recovery lab if that's if that's you know a viable option. The other uh, another option is to is to is to sort of get funding for uh, get funding for all of the equipment you might need ahead of time, which is which would include uh, for you know in modern institutions that are that are actually working with these tools. Typically, they they would buy something called a FRED, a forensic recovery of evidence device that's made by a company called Digital Intelligence. It's kind of an all-in-one machine that provides write blocking facilities and allows you to uh, allows you to perform uh, various types of recovery on those devices. Um, but if you're not at that point where you want to make that kind of investment, um, the, the motivation for um, being able to uh, being able to use uh, use an environment that doesn't really cost you anything is, is fairly powerful, right? So it, as long as you have a, a regular workstation sitting around somewhere in your organization, you can you know you can run BigQuery as a as a virtual machine on it. And as long as you have just a, a few adapters or a USB floppy drive, you can start experimenting with uh, with items that are likely to be in your collection. And, and typically, when we've talked to uh, to collecting institutions that are working with these materials, yes, they do have more exotic media. But but often uh, often when they look through these collections, they're 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 the kind of common media that you would expect: uh, floppy drive or floppy disks, CD-ROMs, uh, occasional older hard disks, um, and and it's a relatively inexpensive way to uh, to uh, to get started examining those materials. Um, so that's mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Um, if anyone else has a question out there, go ahead and type it into the chat box, and uh, Cam will will go ahead and and address it. And, and I, I actually, I should I should add one more thing, which is that you know the the BigQuery environment as it stands today is kind of one piece of the puzzle. So you know many of the institutions that 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 are that that are part of the consortium or, or that use it today uh, tend to deploy it for very specific purposes. So they may use the BigQuery environment just for extraction of bit streams from uh, original media, or they may use it just to run the uh, the, the fast feature identification tools, um, and then perform their uh, and then perform their other uh, packaging and prepar or ingest preparation uh, uh, facilities elsewhere, right? Particularly if they're using a particularly if they're using another uh, collection management system. Um, so this is, you know, this is really designed to fit uh, in a specific place in the workflow, kind of early on in the process, um, and it can be, it can be very helpful. Uh, it can be very helpful in managing, or, or sorry, in, in sort of providing a, uh, or bootstrapping the the process of getting started with collections that you know maybe people haven't touched in 20 years. Mm hmm Definitely. And it sounds like it, um, but I wanted to clarify. So if I had a file that was really old, and let's say I, it, it's maybe a very old version of Word, and you know a current machine wouldn't even uh, open a file for you, is BitCurator able to get around that type of thing so that it could be read? So, so there's no one particular answer to that, but BitCurator does have a, a variety of tools that are Specifically geared towards uh, uh, rendering uh, older older files. So uh, there's a tool in BitCreator called, for, for your particular example, there's a tool called AntiWord in BitCreator that will uh, that will do perform text extraction from original Word documents. Now it won't retain all of the original, uh, won't necessarily retain all the original features of formatting. But again, this is sort of a this is a uh, this would be a step that would. Uh, that would get you started in sort of assessing what the contents of those materials were before moving to 
a uh, before moving to a uh, uh, you know a final data extraction solution. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good. You know, with all of the, we have kind of have like this flood of information, right? We have so much and it's hard to decide, you know, what files we're going to save for the future and so on because there's so much. Do you think BitCurator can help us um, find automated ways of dealing with the vast amounts of information that we're trying to archive? So, again, it's, it's we've, we've tried to, we've tried to, Put this tool chain together in a way that supports uh, supports use cases that are both on the kind of very like uh, the very um, small scale end of the spectrum, right? But then also uh, allow it to be deployed in situations where if you do have uh, significant volumes of data in your collections, it, it can it can it can sorry it can assist in uh, doing kind of high level triage of that. Of that data, particularly for uh, again, particularly for uh, legacy collections, particularly when there's a lot of data that just hasn't been or that's been sort of dead on the shelf for for a long time. Um, I will say we are not uh, the the tools that are in the environment right now are not geared towards uh, live data analysis or network analysis. Um, things like cloud forensics is a is a really uh, is a really kind of new area. And um, most of the tools that we have in this environment will not, uh, or, or don't, uh, aren't necessarily geared towards managing uh, data that would be stored in, in, or particularly document data that would be stored stored in, say, cloud services. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. That's very interesting. Well, you have an, another question uh, from David. He's wondering if you can share any tantalizing real-world forensic stories from a bit curator uh, use. So, so again, this is this is probably going to sound disappointing, but I, <laughs> I, 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 it's been it's been uh, it's been about a, a year and a half since I since we since we went out and collected all these stories. So again, the the best uh, the best that I can say is. Um, Go to bitcurator.net and look through um, some of our old blog posts, and you will see some of the you will see some of the stories there. So we have some nice um, we have some uh, nice stories there from uh, from particularly from Porter at Myth. Uh, so Porter Olson was our community lead for uh, I think about 18 months, and, and basically he traveled all over the uh, the country and, and a few places internationally. And actually did this, right? He he went and he went and got people started using the environment, helped uh, helped institutions get set up with not just Big Curator, but kind of the whole the entire process of uh, of working with legacy media in a way that was that was uh, safe and uh, manageable for uh, for uh, for those institutions, those institutions, particularly those that had sort of limited technical uh, support. And uh, and he has some of those uh, he has some of those stories written up online. I will say occasionally we have users who come to us and 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 want to want to uh, they want very specific technical support but are unable to tell us anything about their collections because they're either they're either closed or uh, they're either closed or uh, or restricted in some way and you know we we do we do work around that when we, when we uh, work with institutions as well but um, you know I, again most of the stories we hear are really just the kind of I don't want to say mundane, but they're you know they're, they're kind of the everyday work of of just trying to uh, you know just trying to to, to battle the uh, the 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 growing pile of legacy media that that these institutions have sitting around in their collections. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have uh, one more uh, question because uh, then I, I'll have to go on to the the business meeting. I think. Uh, so, do you host regional training sessions, and what is the cost? Um, so we, so there's no, there's again, there's no one answer to that. We will do, uh, we will do training sessions on site, uh, depending on the, uh, depending on the event and the location and the institution. So Cal or I or both of us will often come out and uh, and do and do training sessions or workshops. 
it's uh, it works better when we have uh, when we when they're affiliated with another event. So often we'll uh, we'll piggyback workshops on top of other conferences, and there'll be a nominal fee for that workshop. Um, we do we have some uh, active training programs that we do with uh, with public institutions, but uh, we don't have a uh, we don't have a uh, uh, sorry, we don't have like a, a fixed model for uh, for that for, for for coming out and doing and regional training. And you know the best the best uh, if you're if you're specifically interested in a training session, uh, the best uh, person to contact would be uh, Sam Meister at Educopia or to send an email to Cal. All right, all right, terrific. Well, thank you, Cam, for joining us and. Uh, any other links that you have, you know, to the Bit Curator white papers or anything else you'd like us to share, uh, go ahead and send that along, and, and I'll post that. Great. This has been a really fantastic session. I'm very interested in Bit Curator and want to I want to learn more. Great. Um, well, we do have, we do again we have additional resources online. We do have some uh, we do have uh, a YouTube channel that includes walkthroughs of many of these tools. Um, not all of those uh, not all of those videos are up to date, but you can find you can find them there. You can find additional uh, and you can find additional workflow instit institutional workflow diagrams from specific institutions that are using BitCreator right now on the BitCreator Consortium site. So hopefully those will uh, those will both be useful to people. Oh, that would be great. Yeah, that would really uh, lower the learning curve, huh? Yeah. You'd have to develop your own workflow. And we do actually also have a uh, GitHub, sorry, we have a Google group, a user forum. I didn't link it here because it's on the wiki. Um, and that's free and open, and you can, uh, you can join that group. It's low volume, uh, and we answer questions about the environment, and just about, you know, every level of technical expertise is welcome there as well. So. Terrific. Well, thank you so much for joining us, and this was a great presentation. Great. Well, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Cam. Now, Cam, if you could pass the ball on to me, I'm going to go ahead and, and just show a few slides for our business meeting. Great. Did that work? That worked, yes. Great. Well, thank you, everybody. I'm afraid I have to step off to go teach class, but uh, this is wonderful. Thank you. This is really great. Bye. Bye, Cam. Okay, that was, that was really helpful. Well, everybody, this portion of our meeting is, is pretty brief. It's about the work that we've been doing as the Digital Creation Interest Group. And it's it's been pretty busy, actually. Um, this In 2016, we partnered with two other interest groups, the Digital Humanities Interest Group and the Numeric and Geospatial Data Services Interest Group. And we partnered with them because we saw that we had some commonality in our in our work, and that it would uh, that interest both of us to form a digital scholarship section. So at that section level of ACRL, and right now there there isn't a section that just deals solely with digital scholarship. So this seemed like a really nice opportunity for us to work together and to put together a petition so that the ACRL board could um, could vote on it and. Uh, so to get that ready, we, we worked together and we posted it, and then we needed to gather signatures. And so we needed at least 400 signatures for this petition to move from, from a great idea to being voted on. And that took a little bit of effort, and you probably saw some emails uh, from me and others about, uh, about signing the petition. And I just want to say thank you so much. We did make it. Um, and so many people helped out. We ended up with over 400 signatures, and that went through a validity check because people had to be, for the signature to count, people had to be a member of one of the interest groups that have joined. And so we found out after the midwinter meeting that we passed that criteria. And so now uh, the petition will be sent by an ACRL staff liaison to the ACRL board for a virtual vote. So they continue to work throughout the year, even after the midwinter meeting. So assuming that that all goes really well and it passes, um, the next steps will be for us to form an executive committee. Um, 
All right. All right. Thanks. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, the next steps will be for us to form an executive committee for the leadership uh, from the leadership of the three IGs, and then we'll have a nominating committee to self uh, to accept self nominations. So hopefully, any of you who would like to be involved in the in the new section, uh, hopefully you will put your name forward, and then we'll also be working on our our governance documents um, during this time, so that when so that when annual comes, we'll be ready to go. So with that, uh, we do have some more uh, online education opportunities this year. So uh, do keep a lookout. We've got three more webinars planned. There's going to be another one this month on research data creation workflows, and that's with Lisa Johnston at the University of Minnesota. And then in March, we have one lined up uh, for EPAD. It's an EPAD demonstration with a Josh Schneider uh, from Stanford University. And then in April, we'll have an update on VT Arts Works, building a communications hub and digital repository for community cultural development. And that's with Andy Augier with uh, Virginia Tech. So lots more opportunities for learning. And uh, we just have a few moments left, but does anyone have questions about, about anything about, uh, that I just covered regarding the business meeting? All right, well, hearing none, um, I'll go ahead and type my email in the chat box. If you think of a question later on, you please do feel free to get in touch with me. Um, there's my email. Well, this has been a very, uh, very great presentation. I really enjoyed today, and thank you so much for joining us. We'll go ahead and stop the recording, and the link will be posted for, for later viewing. Thanks, everybody.